おそらく仲間たちが乗ったデンジタイガーがこう来るでしょう彼らが大電人に乗り込む前に今までの戦いぶりからして電磁マシンと電磁バギーでこう来ると思いますWhat's up everyone, I am the Kaiju no Kami, and today I'm going to be taking a look at the second of the Marvel Trilogy of Super Sentai series, Denshi Sentai Denjimon from 1980. Due to Battle Fever J's success, Marvel and Toei decided to team up once again for the second installment in the Super Sentai franchise, this time featuring a quintet selected to save the world utilizing the powers from an alien civilization that fled to Earth after its planet, Planet Denji, had been destroyed by an evil empire. In addition to being the first show to feature the heroes using technology from an alien race, Denjimon was also the first series to feature a portable henshin device, a transforming robot, an actual visor on the ranger's helmet, and they called themselves by color in English. Denjimon paved the way for what would become standard Sentai fare throughout the rest of the franchise. Nevertheless, just having a cool idea here or there does not guarantee you're going to be a success. How is Denjimon as a whole? Is it as colorful as its concepts imply? Or was it just a fluke occurrence because it was something different? Let's take a look at the show's heroes to find out. The Heroes Right from the get-go, Denjimon does something completely different as the rangers are not chosen by a military commander, rather they are chosen by a talking dog named IC. Wait, what? Well, now I know where Saban got the idea for Jeb and VR Troopers from. Thankfully, compared to Battle Fever J, our heroes have a lot more depth and backstory to themselves. It isn't perfect, but considering Toei and Ohara were still trying to figure out the Sentai formula, it's fine for what it is. Mostly. Unfortunately, Kenji Oba's return as Ome Daigoro Denji Blue! is really only a change in character name, not personality. Sure, he isn't from Kenya this time around, as he is an acrobat from a circus, however, his character personality remains unchanged as he will always be eating. He even has a locker full of Anpan. And he also gets the most number of episodes to his name compared to everyone else. We get to meet his former circus buddies, including a young orphan girl who looks up to Ome as a brother. <laughs> and a great magician and his daughter. Gentlemen, this is my daughter. Daddy has a most important guest. Nah, that's not right. <laughs> I totally get why he was given his own show years later, as Oba is very talented and really gets into his roles. I just wish Uhara and Gang allowed the other rangers to have equal amounts of screen time as Ome received. The worst of them all is Eichi Suyama's Jin Kiyama, Denji, you! who doesn't get his first standalone episode until episode 25. Kiyama is a scientist who was recruited by IC for his expertise and because he's a great cook, apparently. Hey, I'm going to do Thank you. Uh, uh, he is the man responsible for creating new weapons the team may need in order to defeat the villains for that episode, along with studying any unknown substances that may be left behind. He also hates being given more food than he's paid for, as seen here. He shows off his favorite move from Street Fighter 2. And he doesn't understand the concept of being in a movie theater. Oh, ha, ha. 
I wish I could do that to some people in the theater without having to worry about being reprimanded. Ipei Akagi is the name of Denjimon's team leader. Akagi is a martial artist who teaches his skills to children in order to better themselves. He was actually taught martial arts by the father of one of the reoccurring child characters of the show whose name is Santa. I kid you not, Christmas is always mentioned in this series. Which is kind of funny considering it does not feature a Christmas episode. Like Battle Japan before him, Shinichi Yuki isn't given too much to work with either in order to make Akagi an outstanding character, which is why he is my least favorite of the team. I do like how forward he is, I just wish he had more to work with beyond the times when he befriended a mermaid. Or partook in a boxing deathmatch without his ability to transform. He's also friends with Battle France. Okay, he's not really Battle France here, just a French psychic detective Karachi plays. Oi, oi, Akagi, you touch Kaga? Nani, nani? Sansen and Mini? Which you think I have picked up? You're kidding, right? The next ranger, played by Naoya Yachida, is former police detective Tatsuya Midorikawa. Genji! Green! Midorikawa's father is killed by a monster in the first episode, which is what really encourages IC to pick him to be a member of Denjimon. He's very astute in his thought process, always questioning what is really going on when a weird incident occurs, such as the time when the villains were kidnapping a bunch of jailed criminals. Before becoming a cop, Midori Kawa aspired to be a musician, as we will occasionally see him playing a guitar. We even get to meet a friend of his who has a song that gets played more times than the Goo Goo Dolls, Iris. Honey, honey. Making him 1980s one hit wonder superstar. Time for you to start covering this bad boy, Todd in the Shadows. Oh, and if you were alive in 1998, you probably remember wanting to tear your ears off after hearing Iris so many frickin' times. Cause it was played so many frickin' times. Our final member of Denjima is Akira Kozoimi's portrayal of Akira Momoi. One of the things I do like about Akira is that she was initially reluctant to join Denjimon. Her tennis coach is murdered by the villains in the first episode, yet, after she avenged his death, she didn't really want to be a part of their fight as she wanted to focus on continuing her coach's wishes for her. This didn't last long as she gets attacked by a monster not too long after. Probably for playing the same damn tune that Zoisai played throughout Sailor Moon, which was almost annoying as Iris. Which makes her realize how high the threat truly is. She's also an expert swimmer, teaching children how to swim, and eventually makes a promise to take on the role of being a weaving princess. That's no good. It's your body. No one has the right to touch you if you don't want them to. She also has the honor to be the first Pink Ranger who gets her own dress up episode that would become a staple of the franchise going forward. <laughs> Hi. 
今シストを見なかった I will say that I am not a huge fan of the costumes. There's nothing wrong with them. I just don't like the white stripes on the front and the cloth does nothing for me. I do like the electronic pieces on the helmets, however, and the scarves are a nice touch. They really don't have anything in the way of specific weapons, just personalized attacks, but their Denji sticks merge together to form another spinning wheel of death. It's time for everyone's favorite game. Wheel of Death! Honor while IC is a robotic dog and the sole survivor of Planet Denji, he doesn't do too much. Most of the time he only offers advice to the rangers when it is really crucial or when the show feels the need to provide some exposition. The aforementioned Santa is a part of a gang of children that often find themselves in peril, but at least they are a group of friends we see the rangers hang out with throughout the show, instead of just one-off characters they just happen to know. Lastly, there is a policewoman who constantly shows up throughout the show that used to work with Midori Kawa named Chieko. It is hinted that they are infatuated with each other, though nothing comes out of it as Chieko is more there for comic relief rather than anything else. <laughs> The villains. The villains are an evil alien group who come to Earth to turn it into sludge, known as the Vader Clan. Well, that, or it's just meant to be short for Invader rather than Darth Vader, but Darth Vader is far more fun, especially when you take a look at the villain in the next series. Vader is run by Queen Hedorian, who is played by the great Machiko Soga in her first appearance in Sentai as the main villain. I gotta say that I really like Queen Hedorian, especially compared to the villain leaders before her. She's got a lot of personality, she is the first of the leaders that actually cares for her minions. <laughs> She cares about her dental hygiene. Her looks. Is prone to headaches. And loves to murder pretty women. It also helps that Soga brings a lot of charisma to her character, making her one of the standout villain leaders of the time. If there is anything I do have to complain about with her, it is that she doesn't do anything herself throughout the entire show, as she never once sets foot on Earth, nor does she fight the Rangers once. Nevertheless, as I just said, she is the best leader the franchise has had up to this point in time. Her second in command is General Hedera. No, he is not a giant poop monster. He is a man played by Spider-Man himself, Shinji Toto. General Hedora doesn't do too much either, as I don't recall him fighting the Rangers until the very end of the show, but he too has a great persona to make him a joy to watch on screen. He will often disguise himself as a businessman to recruit people to Vader's side, as he did at one point with an artist who made pretty cool paintings. The two minions of the Vader clan are Mira and Kira. Mira can transform to Hedorian's mirror and crystal ball so she can admire herself or cast spells while Kira turns into a shield once at the end of the show. Fortunately, they do most of their best work on Earth dressing up as regular people all the time to either spy on the Rangers or just scout people worth recruiting to their cause. There is one other villain who shows up around the last quarter of the show named Demon King Bonriki, played by Ken Omei, who appeared as a monster of the week in Battle Fever J. Bonriki has a really solid introductory episode where he bests the Rangers. Like fire, hell fire, this fire. 
eats one of the monsters before it is hatched. And then pretty much does nothing for the next episodes beyond eating, drinking, sleeping, and belittling Hidora for his failures. <laughs> You are good tonight. <laughs> but boy, do I have to say the last four episodes of the series are really spectacular when it comes to developing our villains. Episode 48 barely even features the rangers outside of the designated battle scenes as most of the episode is focused on what is going on with the Vader clan and Bonriki. I wish more had been done with them outside of this, but I'll take what I can get. I will say this though, the villains shine far more in those four episodes than every villain group has in the last five years combined. Unfortunately, the final episode of the show is a tad underwhelming and feels a bit rushed. Anyway, the monster of the week, or simply Vader monsters, hatch out of eggs and are treated to an interesting design palette. They look like they are two different types of creatures or objects that were cut in half and then put together like a pigeon rat. If this were Beast Wars, they would be what I initially envisioned the Fusors were going to be when I first heard about their concept. There's also some interesting choices for monsters such as Soplar, who is great at making clean getaways after a murder. A toothbrush monster. A beehive one. Oh, no, not the bees! Not the bees! Ah! A hamburger. A telephone monster that calls you before it kills you. Best death since the inflatable chair in Doctor Who. A tree. Um, you know, I'm kind of stumped on a joke for this one. This marvelous wonder. <laughs> And Japan was gender bending fictional characters before it was cool, as seen here. You're not Will Smith. Prince Ali, fabulous he, Ali Ababwa. Show some respect. For the first time ever, the Vader monsters can change their own size, so they will often grow big in a fit of rage after losing to the Rangers human sized. This does allow for some interesting ideas though as sometimes the monsters will grow big, fail in its attack as a giant monster, and then shrink back down to continue the fight against our heroes. Lastly, we have a really cool looking group of grunts that follow the half and half theme known as the Dustlars. They aim as good as stormtroopers, but hey, at least they look stylish in their failures! <laughs> The Mecha. Unlike Battle Fever J, who just featured a giant robot, Denjimon features a ship that transforms into one. It's a ship that comes out of a carrier mech known as Denji Tiger, and its name is Dai Denjin. Dai Denjin's color scheme is very. very. odd. It's red, yellow, and blue with bits of silver thrown into the mix. Not exactly the most striking mecha design, though, like I said, it was the first transforming one, so I'll let it slide. The legs also seem to be extremely elongated still. There are some neat mech bottles to be had, although by the last quarter of the series they did start to bore me. 
The effects and music. Oh my god. Nothing in this show will be as amazing as its opening theme that is sung by Ken Narita and Karugi73. From its top-notch intro... <laughs> to its utterly catching tune... <laughs> This opening is hands down one of the best Sentai openings out there. I just cannot get enough of it. Even the ending theme, Denjiman in Makasiro, is just as auditorially pleasing as the opening. Both songs will be stuck in your head for days, if not weeks, after you hear them. Michiaki Watanabe did a wonderful job composing them. As for his music in the rest of the show, it's pretty much the same as it was in Battle Fever J. If you like the music there, you'll most likely enjoy this one too. One track also reminds me of the Gora music from Zelda. <laughs> Still, that opening theme. Oh yeah, I guess I need to talk about the effects too, since that's part of this category. They're no different than they were in Battle Fever J either. The superimposed composite shots continue to impress, while some of the other blue screen effect shots leave a bit to be desired, as seen here when Kiyama and Midori Kawa save a girl from committing suicide. This scene here with Mira and Kira. <laughs> and when Aladdin takes Ome on a magic carpet ride. On the other hand, there is a lot more involvement with the camera work during battle scenes, especially this one here. <laughs> <laughs> This and this one. Regrettably, expect to see a lot of the same footage used repeatedly for fight scenes revolving around the grunts Finally, Denjimon does feature bits where you can see the wires pulling onto ships such as whenever Denji Tiger is pulled out of the ocean, which is also seen right in the opening song. The Episodes Denjimon is one of those rare shows where despite not having a long continuous plot, I found myself enjoying it immensely. The episodes are just a blast all around with a lot of intriguing plots and ideas that I found myself forgetting there wasn't a continuous story. Sure, that more so does leave a bit to be desired, which I will cover in the movie section. For the series itself though, like I said, I enjoyed almost every episode I watched. One of the things I really like about Denjimon is that an episode rarely plays out the way you expect it to. There's one episode where the monster of the week, named Dartlar, is an expert hitman. He attempts to assassinate Akira without success, but it appears as if he was able to kill Midori Oh, 
As we the audience all know, the Rangers faked his death and all will be well with the world. Normally, however, this is something that would occur at the halfway point of the show and at the last minute before the grand finale, Midori Kawa would appear saying something like, HA! I faked my death to drive you out! Here, instead, Midori Kawa reveals it was on act before the halfway point, which forces the villains to change up their plans for the second half of the episode. And this is something that occurs throughout the entire show, so often instead of having a single plot point needlessly stretched out for 24 minutes, we'll have two plot ideas across 12 minutes each. This adds an intriguing concept as neither plot point feels rushed, the villains are always having to adapt their plan of action, while it also shows that the rangers are always on their A-game. I also like how they always figure Vader is involved with any devious plot, so they know to be prepared for a worst case scenario ahead of time. It's quite nice to see heroes who don't act dumb for the sake of acting dumb. On the other hand, there were a couple of times Vader could have won had they not unleashed their inner James Bond villain. <laughs> With that in mind, my favorite episode of the series has got to go to episode 8, The Skeletown's Great Demon King. In this one, Film Laramira and Kira open up a movie theater to show people a free screening of Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Ome takes Santa and a few of the other kids to see this movie, and when they come out of the theater, they find themselves to be old, as does everyone else who comes out of the theater. <laughs> Instantly, the Rangers blame Vader for this and attack them, clearly showing that none of them have ever watched 2001 before. Anyway, this leads to Fimlar using his abilities to put the Rangers into various costumes based on whatever types of monsters he wants them to star in, be it a western, a Chambara film, or a sports one. It's a really cool episode with a lot of great moments. Cool scenery. and was the one I had the most fun with. The runner-up for my favorites is the one with the telephone monster. As for my least favorite episode, that one goes to a simple episode titled The Pupped Rainbow Balloons. I'm not really sure how to describe this one, as it isn't a bad episode in its execution, it's just that the child character is beyond dumb. Like, Cole is brighter than this girl. Basically, a young girl is lonely because her scientist dad is working on a project that could help defeat Vader. As such, Ad Balloonlar disguises himself as an old man and takes the girl to Tokyo to meet with her father so he can sabotage his work. Stranger danger. Let me reiterate this. The girl willingly goes with the old man just because he's nice to her. King of Night so if you introduce yourself to a stranger, they're not a stranger anymore. Enough <sighs> said. The movie. Whereas Battle Fever J's theatrical film was just an episode put into theaters, Denjimon featured a full-length 45-minute feature film that made it look like the show was going to have this continuous plot going throughout it. The Vader clan is trying to find a descendant of the Denji race after they mingled with regular people on Earth, or one of them holds a rainbow crystal that once belonged to Denji's princess who fled her homeworld with the oh-so-original name, Princess Denji. For the most part, I did enjoy the film, especially the extended opening song, <laughs> The fish monster who changes his sizes throughout. And 
and that the movie made it seem like we were going to get a big reoccurring plot throughout the show revolving around Princess Denji and if the Denjimon are actually descendants of her race. Denjimon tachi mo ima kara 3000 nen mukashi kono chikyu ni utsuri sunda to iwareru Denji seijin no shison na no de arou ka. Instead, none of that happens as this plot is pretty much non-existent in the show outside of the princess being mentioned a few times afterwards, leaving an underwhelming, unfulfilled subplot in the end, which I did feel harmed the show as a whole. I feel like an entire story arc could have been dedicated to this aspect, which could have really elevated it above some of its future brethren. As is, it's like eating a chocolate chip cookie where the cook forgot to include the chocolate chips. While I absolutely loved everything revolving around Denjimon, that gaping plot hole regarding Princess Denji does affect my overall score of the show. As does the lackluster nature of Von Riki, and the ending is kind of weird, even for Sentai standards. As such, I am going to be giving Denjimon only a 4 out of 5 grown-ups in spandex. This is most definitely a Sentai series you need to check out. Especially because that opening theme is so amazing. Let's hear it again one more time. <laughs> oh, so awesome. Until next time, bye.